Hello and welcome to the latest edition of This Racing Life. We have come down to the National Stud to check in on one of our favourite stayers of recent times in Stradivarius. Also housed here are Raja Singh, Time Test and Lope E. Fernandez. So let's catch up with them too and also find out what this marvellous historic stud farm has to offer elsewhere. I've been really lucky in, in my career to have worked at some of the biggest and best stud farms in the world. Uh, I started off in New Zealand which provided me with the foundation um, with horses and, and working on a stud farm at Wentwood Grange. That was an incredible experience. Uh, I was very lucky to do the Godolphin Fly and Start programme which just opened up uh, unbelievable doors for me. Uh, stints at Chivalry Park, uh, Hazelwood Bloodstock, La Mater Eye in France and now to the National Stud so try to bring all those together and push forward here at the National Stud. You've got some lovely stallions of course here, four of them at the moment and Stradivarius is the latest of those. Must be quite a thrill to have such a famous and popular stayer making his way to the National Stud. It is an honour to have a horse like Stradivarius. Uh, he was a horse that really meant a lot to his owner Bjorn Nelson but to the wider racing public. Um, you watched him in his races, you watched him out in the heath and then all of a sudden he turns up and he's here at the National Stud every day. And, and that really brings everybody who works here a great joy and a great privilege. We, we look around, we've got the stallion graves over there of previous uh, stallions who stood here at the National Stud. The statue of Miller Reef, who was an unbelievable stallion and really important to the history here. Stallions are an incredibly important part of what the National Stud do. Uh, they're incredibly important for British breeders and for us to be able to offer these stallions here. Um, look, it's, it's amazing and to offer such a wide range for everybody, uh, it's, it's an important part of what we do. And I suppose given the time spent on the racetrack from Stradivarius, it's quite unusual for someone of his age to become a stallion at this time, but uh, exactly what he's done. Does it um, represent a few challenges for you in that regard? Uh, not so much challenges, I suppose it was we didn't really know uh, how a horse of his age would react to his new role and his new career. Um, it turns out there's no really no difference than what a, a young stallion would be like. Um, he settled into his routine very well. He loves being out in the paddock. Um, he's very demanding in that he wants to be out first. He wants to be out in the paddock first. He thinks he's the boss. I can uh, believe that to be fair. Yeah, perhaps <laughs> we'll find out if he is the boss in a few years, but um, at the minute he's definitely acting like it. Um, so he settled in, in really well. Uh, we had great guidance from um, John Gosden and the team there, which really helped us sort of just make sure that he had every opportunity to settle in well. Um, but he's a very straightforward horse, he, he's great uh, at covering, uh, he's, in terms of that process, that's been very straightforward and I suppose most importantly he's getting the mares in full. And with him, are you hoping to attract a particular kind of mare? Look, this was, this was the, the fascinating thing about Stradivarius. Um, I don't think, I think we can speak honestly, he was pigeonholed his whole career in terms of what sort of stallion prospect he would be. Um, but we didn't do that, uh, nor does his owner Bjorn Nelson. Uh, we feel that he can attract, and he has attracted, a wide variety of mares from sort of six furlong Kodiak mares to sort of mile and a half mares. It's an amazingly interesting process for us to be part of because we'll see, um, you know, next year what sort of foals he's, uh, he's producing. Um, one thing we do know is that we look at Stradivarius and the, his physicality and the way he's put together, he's incredibly athletic. Um, he's incredibly balanced, definitely one of the most balanced horses that I've ever seen and we suspect that, that we'll see that in his foals. Um, Stradivarius is one of your stallions here at uh, the National Stud. You've also got three other ones. Um, let's talk about each one of them individually. Firstly, Lope Fernandez, a completely different type to Stradivarius, of course, more of a sprinter and he's just had his first few foals. Yeah, European champion sprinter, uh, an amazing horse to retire here at the National Stud. An amazing partnership involved with Whitsbury Manor. Um, who's had the most incredible few years and had, a, had an amazing weekend at the Guineas. Uh, and Nick Bradley Racing, who's probably one of the biggest syndicator of horses in the UK. Um, so it was a great to have that partnership and support to be able to put into a stallion. We're stronger together, we've supported him really well, uh, and we couldn't be happier with the foals. Um, his first foals are exactly what we sort of pitched to people in that they would have plenty of size, plenty of bone, uh, and plenty of strength in the right areas. So we're, we're really happy. Yeah, we took a little bit of a look earlier and a couple of them look fantastic. Yeah, yeah, they're incredibly athletic foals and they've all got good size and substance. So we're, we're just really happy with what he's sort of producing and he'll cover a bigger book this year than he did in his first year, which is testament to his popularity uh, and testament to how good a racehorse he was. Yeah, he was an absolutely brilliant racehorse. Roger Singh was a, was a very good one himself as well. And a very fast horse too. Yeah, incredible. Like, unbelievably fast, you know, set the, set the track record for the commentary, which is probably one of the most stallion-making races uh, in the racing calendar. Uh, he's built like a sprinter, he's, he's muscle on muscle, 
and he was a great horse for his owner Phil Collingham and trainer and Richard Spencer so uh, he's a horse that offers breeders great value for money um, in terms of if you want to produce a really good racehorse with your mare uh, at a level that you can afford he's the perfect stallion for that. And finally the last of your four at the moment is Time Test, a horse that I used to love I have to say on the racetrack. Yeah. He's like Time Test. He's an incredibly important horse for the national stud. We obviously own him outright. Uh, he got off to an amazing start with his two-year-olds into the three-year-old year. Horses like Crypto Force came out, Rocky Gianni, and we are in a great place with him. He's got huge numbers coming through. His horses are all placed. The two-year-olds are placed with some of the best trainers in the UK and Ireland. So we have full belief that he'll go on to to do great things. Yeah, and I suppose with already getting results from his progeny, like you say, Rocco Gianni getting second in the German Guineas, winning at Glorious Goodwood, that's a perfect start, really, isn't it? Yeah, like he's out, he's racing in Hong Kong now, uh, and he's got off to a great start out there. Uh, Crypto Force, we're hoping to see him out in the summertime, uh, competing in Group One races. Um, so. It's very exciting and there's plenty of two-year-olds to come out. And I think the facilities here and the, the tranquility really complement the wonderful stallions we've got. What a wonderful place for them to be as well. Yeah, like amazing for these horses. They, they, they live an amazing life. They're looked after to the highest of standards and cared for 24-7, 365 days a year. Well, we're very lucky to live here uh, and live and work here uh, as most of the, the stud staff do. So uh, we take great pride in the place and uh, we hope that they just continue to grow in the future. Students have always been a, a big and fundamental part of the National Stud. It's great to see so many of them around here. How much of a part do they play and uh, how important are they going forward? Yeah, like we have got various pillars of what we do here at the National Stud in, in terms of stallion, boarding, consignment. Education stands alongside that. It is equally as important as, as those three. Um, we offer education, educational programmes for students to come here and learn about the thoroughbred industry to give them a really strong platform, platform to go forward in their career and um, it's very satisfying that we can get people at our gates that are wanting and eager to learn uh, and we take them in, we give them amazing opportunities, they learn about breeding and stallions and consignment um, and, and they, they thrive off it, they really enjoy it. And I wanted to ask you quickly about the diploma as well, the course, we've met a couple of people earlier on and they, uh, they were loving life and I imagine that kind of thing is quite helpful as well around the yards. Yeah, it's, it's very helpful. The students bring a, a, I suppose an air of enthusiasm to, uh, to the stud at a, a particular time where, where we need it in the breeding season. Um, it's, it's very satisfying to see young people come to our gates who want to learn about horses. They want to work on a world-class stud farm and we give them the opportunity to do that and then place them going forward uh, in, a, in a farm across, farms across the world that can really develop and bring their career to the next level. So uh, incredibly lucky to have students that are so keen and so eager uh, and show such enthusiasm for the sport and for the industry. Luke, lovely to be alongside you in this beautiful setting here at the National Stud. You're part of the diploma course, just tell us a little bit about that. Well basically we're here during the breeding season here at the National Stud, so we'll be working with the stallions, obviously with the mares and foals. We'll be over at the foaling unit as well for when they fall, we'll be there to assist with any foalings throughout the season. So basically, yeah, getting stuck in with every aspect of the breeding season. Yeah, probably getting stuck in as you are now, next to this beautiful beast. <laughs> Let's hope it doesn't get loose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And uh, you're, you're, a, you're obviously a big fan of racing, quite young. What's yeah. the ambition in your life? Well, basically, I've always been a fan of racing, obviously. So I've been watching racing my whole life, and this was my into the horse racing industry. Obviously, never going to be a jockey, the height of me, so <laughs> yeah. this was my in, working with the breeding industry. So I applied for actually the level one course this time last year, so having no experience whatsoever, and now within a year, hopefully after completing this course, I'll be off to Australia. And you live on site here, which isn't too far away from the race course. Yeah, we've got a toss at the top of the road by the gates to the National Stud, so we can just hop over the fence and the July course is within walking distance. And you said you were um, planning on going to Australia. That's going to be so experienced, working with some, some pretty exciting stallions. Oh yeah, hopefully going over to Wood and Stud come the middle of July. Their season starts August the 1st, so we'll be working with Zoo Star, Trapeze Artists. So, yeah, some big names, considering this time last year I hadn't touched a horse. So, that is amazing to think yeah, that, isn't it? Very exciting indeed. So after that year you've had now, what would your day-to-day -day, uh, travails be at, at the stud? What, what would you be tasked with? Well, each week we get set a different yard to go work on, where it be with the mares and foals, the stallions, or even uh, there's barren mares and maiden mares that may have come out of training, ready to be covered. So, yeah, each week we'll get set, set on the yard and we'll be working away with them. Always something a bit different. Yeah, there's always a change of scenery. And what would be your favourite stallion? Ooh, 
I think. And you don't have to say what Ernesto's done. <laughs> well, we will. We'll go Lofi Fernandez. Just the way he carries himself, the walk, the walk on him. He puts it into his foals. So, yeah, exciting times ahead. And his foals look, they look really rather nice. We've seen them a little bit earlier and they've got plenty of precocity about them. They're the talk of the town now. Yeah. So, yeah, we hope that uh, next year when they're yearlings, they sell well and obviously go on to produce some good two year olds, hopefully down the line. What would be the, the ultimate ambition for you, for you to see at the National Stud? A champion stallion. I mean, that's, I think for any stud standing stallions, that's what we're all trying to achieve. Uh, we would like to see, we would like to produce horses that really contribute towards the longevity of the sport in terms of uh, their soundness and quality of care. I think we do that as we discussed every day. Uh, the National Stud is a unique, um, it's a unique stud farm. We're here to sort of serve British breeders and as part of the jockey club that's really important in what we do. So just to secure the future of the National Stud and, and, and put it in a good place. What a fabulous racehorse Stradivarius was. We thought we'd come down and find out a little bit more about him from someone who knows him perhaps better than most, Rab Havlin, and also learn some more about those wonderful horses that have been housed at Clarehaven Stables over the years. He was a bit of a favourite run about the Heath and you know when you get days at the Guineas and a lot of spectators run about the Heath in the morning, they were always looking well, they didn't have to ask who he was. He usually let them know who he was. He, was uh, <laughs> he could be quite vocal in the morning, so he was a, he was a special type of horse. The style of some of his wins were so tenacious that they, they stuck in the memory. So, yeah, you can imagine he would be he'd be pretty popular up there. Was he one of those horses from an early stage that you always thought had an abundance of talent, or did it kind of grow over time? I rode him at Nottingham first time, at, and he run typically like uh, one of ours. He we knew he was going to come on for the run, and then. He was actually favourite when he came up to the Rolly Mile the next day. And Frankie rode him, he was favourite that day. And I rode Cracksman and obviously Cracksman <laughs> won, so he wasn't a bad one. I went to Newcastle and he, and he won at Newcastle and he, he showed a lot of tenacity that day. He, um, he got headed and he, he, he had a, a real fight with um, one of um, uh, Saeed's horses, Pat, Pat Cosgrave, and, and got back up on the line. So, you know, and that was obviously over a mile. So. You know, as he start, gradually stepped up in trip, we, we kind of realised how good he was. Yeah, it shows how much talent he had that he could win over such a short distance before going on to the staying trips. He, he was by no means a slow horse. You know, he won over those set of trips, but he he ran in the Coronation Cup up here um, against Gaith. They had it here because, because of COVID. And he broke the track record and he was able to, you know, he finished third. And I yeah. remember Beyond saying, oh, do you think it was the right thing, you know, when he came in to see him? afterwards and I said he's never felt better after the race you know he he feels as if you could <laughs> nearly win a group one over a mile and a half and look he went to Ascot after that and I think it was one of his most impressive victories when he when he uh, beat the F road so like he, he basically never come off the bridle did he yeah and you said he's, he was a willing partner when you when you rode him what was he like as a ride was he was he always giving and he was a nice ride to have for you he, he was you know in the mornings he was uh he just went around the place. Like when you went in to tack him up, he would come at you with his teeth and his ears flat back. And if you didn't know him, you would say, there's no way I'm going in that stable. But <laughs> yeah. uh, as soon as you walked in and put the bridle on him, he was good as gold. We've been lucky enough to have some of those big horses, you know, like real big star horses even in the yard. And he was definitely right up there with them, you know. And you've been at the Goldstones for a long time now. As a workhorse, how would Stradivarius compare to some of the, the better ones you've had over the years? He was pretty push button in his work. He would do exactly what you asked him to do and, and not a single bit more. Um, but the odd occasion you would pull him out and he'd just completely shock you by obliterating anything that was next to him and, and going about three or four or five lengths clear. So he was, uh, yeah, he was a real, real character. And in terms of workhorses you've had or you've, you've been involved in it at the Gossens over the last kind of three decades or so, um, who would have been the the most exciting horse at home in their work. Kingman. That, Kingman. Was, that was very quick and easy to yeah, say, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Kingman was, um, he was an amazing horse. He, uh, I rode him all the time and <clears throat> before, before he went to the Guineas, he used to quicken up past the lead horse, like put three, four lengths between them and then he'd just pull up and the lead horse would be back upside him again and that was just him. He had so much raw pace, didn't he? Oh, he had raw pace. He, I mean, he could have, and he'd the mind. You see, he, he'd like be in behind in a gallop, literally off the bridle. But as soon as you give him a couple of clicks, he was gone. You know, he'd just change his legs twice and gone. And, uh, you know, he was winning his races before the guineas. It, probably because he never had a hard race is the reason he, he, 
got beaten again is because he really was just playing with everything, you know? <laughs> yeah. And he was, I remember when he came back after uh, getting beaten up here in the Guineas by Night of Thunder, I rode him up the, uh, I think it was the, it was the, sh no, it was the, the round gallop. And I pulled him out expecting, you know, that was, this was in between the Irish, the English Guineas and the Irish mm. 2000 Guineas. And I pulled him out expecting his usual thing. He did a few, a few um, reminders in the, in the Guineas, obviously. And I pulled him out and he quickened three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine lengths clear and just kept going. Yeah. I think I pulled him up at the traffic lights on the Bury Road. Goodness me. And uh, we were just, everybody was like... Like riding a Ferrari. Yeah. We just thought oh, there'll have to be something really, really good to ever beat this again. So. Were you surprised that he got beaten at Newmarket? I wasn't, I wasn't, but, you know, we, we thought he'd win. But then watching it, I knew exactly what had happened. Because, as I say, he was just so good. He was winning every race, his races previously, without having to have a hard race. And he just done in the guineas what he, you know, he went and won his race that side. And unfortunately, Night of Thunder hung across the track, so he didn't really see him. And he kind of just down tools, really. So, you know, he, he learned, certainly learned from it. He was an intelligent horse. And uh, well, he never got beat again. And he turned into one of the best milers I've ever seen, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they tried everything to get him beaten, beat him by going slow and he just nothing worked. He was just so so push button and his, his acceleration was amazing. Would he have been one of your favourites as well? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, he definitely was my favourite. Really? <laughs> yeah. Every, every, every uh, other horse yeah, you've look, I had, yeah. I, I've had favourites, you know, as, you, as you're riding, but like looking back, um, uh, yeah, I, re I really loved him. He's a good horse. Talking of, of raw speed, Oasis Dream had plenty of that as well. Um, I know from a few stories in the past that he was always a pretty exciting workhorse as well. He was, he, he was very laid back. Sean Mulvey used to ride him the whole time and uh, I rode him a few pieces of work. I remember one day, he was literally a, a little bit like Kingman, he used to travel in behind the bridle and I worked him with a couple of horses at Manton on the straight five and I sat last. And he just, he never used to join before a place called the Stone at Manton because it's quite stiff. And uh, just be half a furlong before the stone, he'd kind of dropped off the, the second horse a little bit. And I just gave him a click to, to go and lay up a bit. And I shot past the whole gallop and went about five, six lengths clear. And of course they come past me at the end because <laughs> I'd gone way too soon. So uh, he was so relaxed, he just took, took me by surprise. But uh, yeah, he, he did an amazing ton of foot as well. And uh, Hughesy had some great days on him. Yeah, it must have been a pleasure to be able to ride a horse of that calibre at home as well. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I've been lucky enough before that, you know, to have worked for Chapelheim and I was apprenticed to Chapelheim, so we had pretty, some pretty amazing horses by it then, like Rod Di Rodrigo Di Triano and mm -hmm. Dr. Davis and Tuttle Island and things like that. So, um, yeah, it's, it's some, some good ones over the years. That was a great foundation, I imagine, as well, being there. Yeah, great. I mean, Peter trained a little bit differently to, um, to uh, the Boston Theory, but, uh, you know, he could get the job done and, you know, his results spoke for themselves. He could ready a two-year-old and, you know, they would, they would win through the year and win, and come out and win guineas and derbies the following year. So, you know, he, he was a great trainer and when he gets the right horses, he can still do the job. What's your relationship been like with Frankie over the last kind of few years? He's one of my best mates, so uh, he's best man at my wedding. Um, we were friends before, you know, when he was still riding for Godolphin and, you know, then when he, he got the job back here, it was, you know, it was great because you know your friends best, back <laughs> we're, yeah we're best mates off the track and and on it so uh yeah i, I really enjoyed that i saw that he gave you a nice public um plaudits for when you won on commissioning your first group one winner last year as well yeah he finally managed to get banned and give me one <laughs> <laughs> i bet you were yeah. waiting a long time for that yeah. one yeah. Like, um, it was great and uh for Shea Kisa, who's like a sponsor of mine's and you know he's a really really enthusiastic guy Shea Kisa. he's a great man for the sport and i'm sure he'll be in the sport for many years to come. It was just a shame the, the filly picked up a, an injury and had to be retired because, you know, she was going to be very, very classy. She already, already was very classy, you know. Yeah, it was a massive shame. She showed so much potential, didn't she, from an early stage of her career? She did. Look, she, obviously, she's unbeaten and, you know, she, again, was, like the traits of a good horse, she showed a lot of tenacity. She was got outpaced in the rock fell and, and managed to overcome that and win. And, Again, she got out, outpaced running into the dip in the uh, Phillies Mile, and you know, she was well on top at, top at the end, so she had a really bright future. 
And I imagine in terms of, of your emotion that day, it must have been one of the greatest days of your career. It was, but it was just relief, really. <laughs> <laughs> Great to get the monkey off my back. Lord North is another one I wanted to chat to you about because he's a horse who's been around for quite a long time now, has kept that very high level of form. And obviously you've ridden a, a winter derby victory on him as well. So he must have a, a special place in your heart too. Yeah, he was, um, I rode him all his first wins. He was he was a hooligan at the start. Really? A real thug. Yeah, he um, he wasn't a nice ride. And uh, he used to have a, a problem with the stalls. I think he knocked the stall handler at once. Really? At uh, Newcastle, he threw his head back and and basically knocked him out, but uh, like he, we ended up, uh, he, he get, we ended up gelding him, and that was the making of him really. You know, he calmed down and started enjoying his racing a little bit more. And obviously, when we stepped him up to a mile and a quarter, he became a different horse altogether. So uh, yeah, he's a he's a character around the around the place as well. He only he only does what he has to do in the mornings, and I think the older they get, they do tend to be like that. I think like most human beings, we. We, we only do the bare minimum, what, what, what we have to do, really. <laughs> yeah, and it shows his constitution to keep coming back and doing it at that very high level as well. Well, it's a great training performance. Yeah. You know, you've you got to mind these horses and you don't push them when they no, don't need to be pushed. And we're not h hard on them at home. It's bridal, everything's bridal work. If they can go on in hand, two or three lengths, three or four lengths, it'll be in hand. It won't be anything off the bridle. And, um, and you know, that shows you know, they, they have a certain constitution, you know, later on that we seem to get more miles out of them that way. Yeah, it seems as that patient approach really pays off for John and Thady. You know, he's got a lot of patience when he when he should go mad. Sometimes I can see him going mad behind the eyes, but the face, he just keep, keeps calm. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he, he's got that way around him and, you know, he obviously trains his horses that way and, and Thady's the same, you know. And talking of Thady, he's becoming more involved in everything now? Yeah, well, Thady's been involved in everything for quite a number of years, really. And, uh, I mean, when he started spending more time in the yard, he actually used to come race with me all the time, and, you know, we'd, we'd be on road trips everywhere. Oh, so, that's great. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, um, yeah, he's been, he's been around for a long time, and he's brought um, new owners to the yard, and, you know, his new ideas, and we've started venturing a little bit further afield and having runners, you know, in, in Bahrain and such places, and... Yeah, he's, uh, he's, he's got a lot of new ideas, but still carries a lot of the, the, the boss's old traits, really. So a nice mixture in between yeah, should, should uh, hopefully keep the success rolling in. Yeah, and let's move on to, to your career itself. And you must be absolutely thrilled when you look back at those big races you've won over the, over the years. Yeah, look, we've won plenty of big races over the years. And, um, you know, a lot of people couldn't believe I hadn't had that group one. And that, it wasn't well, I couldn't. I was amazed. <laughs> it wasn't something I was broadcasting to a lot of people, to be <laughs> honest with you. Know, every time they went on about it on TV, I'd just say, would you shut up about that, God almighty? But uh, look, I've been very, very fortunate to be in the position I've been in with the boss for so many years. And, you know, um, you know, he's been very loyal to me. And I like to think I've been very loyal to him. And it's brought rewards for both sides, really. And uh, although I didn't get the group one until last year I've been happy with the way my career has went over the years and hopefully can keep going for another few years. Absolutely it seems like loyalty does play a big part with John and his riders. Yeah of course um, you know it's not a place you want to leave put it that way yeah. so I mean it's more him being loyal to me than me being loyal to him <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah look you know he's uh, he can see what happens in a race you know what I mean he's you when I ring him he's already we're already talking about the same things and you know, we're trying to pick things out of races and, uh, you know, it's you don't need to ring him up and tell him how a race went because he watched the race as well as, of course, you know yeah. what I mean? It, you often hear people saying, you know, well, I jumped at the stalls and I sat second. I remember, I can't remember what the jockey was. And, uh, he was ringing Barry Hills up and he, he says, yeah, well, I jumped that boss and I sat second and then, uh, you know, at the four pole I moved up and Barry Hills said, I did watch the race. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell me anything about the horse? <laughs> so, you know. I think the boss, uh, we, we all sing off the same, same hymn sheet, really. Would he be quite um, decisive when he talks to you about um, rides that you're going to have in the parade ring, for example, before the races? Would he be telling you exactly what to do or do you leave you with a little bit of room for, for manoeuvre? No, not at all, really. You know, um, I'll ring him up, I'll speak before every race and I'll say, look, I know this filly, she's a lengthener or, you know, we might, we might be running one that's a little bit nervy, so we'll be trying to take things slow and 
and get him, him or her to finish the race without frightening him or her. And uh, so basically, we'll discuss it. He will never really say, do this, do that. He knows I know the horses and I try, if I'm riding them through the week and I haven't sat on them, I'll speak to Barry and say, can you put me on that filly two or three days beforehand mm. so as I can familiarise myself with them. So, you know, I'll know as much about them as the boss will. So we'll just talk beforehand and know that we're singing off the same hymn sheet, really, when, when we go to the sports. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we talked about commissioning, we talked about Lord North. I did look through some of your, your biggest wins in your career and towards the beginning of the, uh, your riding career. I, I did notice an interesting curiosity that you went abroad and won the Swiss St. Ledger and I think the Italian Oaks and the Italian Derby as well. So you've, you've been around a few countries yeah, as well. Yeah, I, I used to take myself off to, uh, I go everywhere, be have, have saddle well travel sort of thing. So, <laughs> you know, I went to, there's some in that list that, that, that won't even be on the list, you know, like, uh, you know, derbies and Slovakia and things like that. <laughs> and yeah, I won a couple of Swiss derbies and a Swiss St. Ledger and, I won the Italian derby. I, I used to go to Germany quite a lot, so uh, like most Sundays in Switzerland, most Sundays. So I'd ride German horses in, in Italy. We used to take them to, to Italy quite a while. So uh, I, there was actually two German horses. I won the Italian derby really? and, the, uh, yeah, and the Italian Oaks on. So I uh, managed to do, do well doing that. Was it quite a different style in terms of riding when you, when you go to those foreign countries? Or was it similar? Italy's lovely country to ride in, you get loads of room. Um, some of the other countries, it's like amateurs are, are allowed to ride against professionals, so it's a bit... I was talking to Ronnie O'Sullivan one day and he said, is it any different riding in a bad race to riding in a good race? And I said, it's much easier to ride in a good race because you're riding with people that you can read what they're about to do next. And sometimes, you know, when you're, like in those countries, amateurs be riding, you, you'd be sitting tracking and thinking, right, he's going to go there now, and mm. he'd do exactly the opposite. And I remember Ronnie O'Sullivan saying to me, he said, it's like that with me sometimes, he said, because they opened these tournaments up to Johnny the Painter, mm. and he says, and I would take it, you know, make the break, and then I would know exactly what was happening for the rest of the game, and Johnny the Painter would come in and just smash them everywhere, and he'd, I, I'd be like baffled and think, oh my God, what am I going to do next? <laughs> yeah. So it's a, it's a little bit like that. Um, you know, you, in, in good races, you can nearly read what the jockey in front of you is going to do next because if you were in that position, you'd be doing the same yourself. So, Yeah, that brings us nicely to talk about jockeys themselves. You're one of the more experienced hands now in the weighing room. Of those coming through, do you think we've got a nice bunch at the moment? Yeah, I think so. You know, obviously Ben was a nice little rider. He's a very nat natural horseman. you got Harry Davis. Uh, you know, obviously Oshin and there's loads of young lads there that are, you know, you could name, you know, Tom Marquand and, and lads like that. And, uh, you know, it's a lot different to, to when I was growing up, um, a little bit more professional and a little bit more scrutiny on them. You know, the TV cameras are on them the whole time and social media, so they, they you know, they wouldn't be able to enjoy themselves as much as we did at the start <laughs> when I started. Uh, sure that's so, true. yeah, there, there's a good bunch of young lads and, you know, they, you just need to see which which ones last and what, what don't because, you know, over the years you see them come and go. In terms of your journey, it's obviously been a fairly long one now, running some great winners, Gregorian, you know, Lord North, all those, all those types in the past. How, how how long do you think you can see yourself going on for? I'll just keep going until um, nobody wants me anymore. <laughs> or, or I feel as if uh, my body's, or, or I'm not performing like I have been, but I feel as if I'm riding as good as I have been. and. I mean, still enjoying it, although the Newcastle evening meetings sometimes get to a bit of, bit of a drag, but they normally result in a winner or two, so uh, we'll keep taking them. I'll just keep going, as long as I feel fit, you know. I keep myself pretty fit, you know, I've got a gym at home, and I think, as we spoke before, like, it's a bit different to the old days, you know, there's a, there's a real emphasis, you've got to be fit these days, and um, it's a lot of goods come come out of that because you get a little bit of longevity for your for your own career. So um, I'm glad those days are gone. And you still enjoy it as much as you always have done. Yeah, of course. I enjoy I enjoy riding winners, and and uh, thankfully the job I'm in winners keep coming. So long well, may it continue. That's it for the latest edition of This Racing Life, another tour of HQ done and dusted. Thanks to all those who opened their doors to us. See you all very soon.
Watch live racing now on RacingTV.com.